Hello, and welcome to the 45 day requirements webinar. Next slide. My name is B. Nichols, and I'm the Director of Program Operations here at the Department of Family and Support Services. Today, the operations and administrative unit teams are going to be working together to provide you with all the information that you need regarding the requirements that must occur within the first 45 days of programming. The team supervisors will introduce themselves as they begin their respective sections. We want you to know that we are providing this training in a train the trainer approach, meaning the expectation is for you to take this information back to your agencies and site teams. Next slide. What will be covered in this webinar? We're going to go through the four to five day requirements for each of the content areas, health, education, family and community engagement, and program management. New this year, we are going to also incorporate a COPA crosswalk so you know exactly what data you need to enter for each of these content areas. Remember, you have the Sales 2.0. Everything that we will be talking about today can be found in the Sales. We will also have a question and answer section towards the end of the webinar. And you will have access to this presentation. We will give you the PowerPoint slides so that you can go back and do the train and trainer approach. That should be coming to you and be available by the end of this week. So we're going to go ahead and start the webinar. Nicole. Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Kraft and I am one of the newest supervisors with the Program Operations Unit. I'm pleased to be here and I'm looking forward to working with the Children's Services Division. So this year has been a pretty um, crazy and uncertain time due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we've all been ex experiencing. So I want to share a little information with you um, from the Office of Head Start regarding um, how we will implement our services for this year. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Office of Head Start is providing flexibility related to timelines for completing developmental vision and hearing screenings, determining whether a child or pregnant woman has access to health care, determining if a child is up to date on preventive and primary medical and oral health care, and scheduling newborn visits with each mother and baby. Next slide, please. While adhering to these standards is vitally important, programs will not be penalized in the program year 2020-2021 if they are not able to meet these requirements. However, programs are expected to make every effort to complete these requirements within the timeframes and should document those efforts. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss what's actually expected at the beginning of the program year as it relates to health services. During the first 45 days, all children ages birth to five must have a complete up-to-date physical exam prior to attendance. The State of Illinois Certificate of Child Health Examination form is used to record results. Programs must determine whether families have a medical or dental home within 30 days of enrollment and follow up if a home is needed. This is a requirement as outlined by the Early Head Start and Head Start performance standards. All PFA and PI programs are to follow the DCFS licensing standards. Programs must obtain physicals for home visiting children within 90 days of enrollment. They are also to obtain dental exams within 45 days of attendance. All programs are to conduct research-based developmental screenings within 45 days of enrollment. Birth to three programs should administer 
the ages and stages questionnaire three. Preschool programs are required to administer early screening inventory revised, and all programs are to conduct the ages and stages questionnaire social emotional two. We, we encourage programs to continue to monitor and follow up on any missing medical immunizations and dental pro in information. Next slide, please. Next, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Craig Zimke, who explained to us how to enter this information in the COPA system. Good afternoon, or whatever time it is when you actually watch this um, training. As Nicole mentioned, uh, all of the information from the health screening, the physical, the immunizations, growth assessment need to be entered into COPA. If you're not able to get them from your remote families during the crisis, you should still be documenting those efforts uh, on your case notes. When we talk about documenting medical records, we're looking at two distinct points during the program year. We collect information on the status of children when they first enroll, and we also keep track of how they are doing during the program year so that we can get information on how they how they are at the end of the program year and whether any missing screenings were, were attained or um, any outstanding health issues were addressed. So when we start the program year, right, like we're right now in the first 45 days, the first thing we need to enter is the health history, if you're in the child file in COPA, you, there's a link at the top in that scrolling menu at the top of the screen entitled health history. And when you click on that link, you'll get to a forum that has a lot of questions about the child's health status, starting from uh, information about when the child was born, the child's history of illnesses, up to the status of the child's medical things when they're enrolling now. Um, what's important to know about this, and I'll come back to this a couple of times to make sure that, it, that everyone understands this because there's nothing else you take away from this. I want you to take this away. The health history is just a questionnaire that you take at the beginning, but then you are expected to collect a physical for every child and have that information entered. If in the course of entering that information, you find that the information on the health history was not correct, it should be fixed. So if a parent comes in and says, yes, the child is up to date on all their health screenings, they probably don't know what they're supposed to have. Um, we don't either. We would have to look at the, the, the state mandated schedule. So make sure that that's the case. If it turns out from the medical record that that's not the case, you will need to uh, go ahead and come back here to the health history and fix it, whether that's fixed with us about immunizations or health insurance or the status of health screening. And next slide, please. The other piece that everyone should be having uh, at this point of the year is the immunization and TB. This is especially for children who are attending center-based programs. As you know, you are supposed to be licensed, and if you're a licensed child care provider, you should have immunization records on all the children who are attending. So this, again, and from the child's record, you go to the top of the screen and you select the link that says immunization and TB. Now, when you look at this, you will, the first thing that might strike you is there are more blanks than you will have information on the form, most likely. So if you see the screen right now for many of these immunizations, there is room to put in five separate shots from a shot record. But most of these only require three. The reason that there are more blanks is we want to capture everything that's on the child's record. So in cases where perhaps the child started receiving immunizations as a newborn and then didn't keep up with the schedule and had this restart later on in order to be eligible for child care or other services, then we want to have the initial shot and the current ones in there. So that's why there is space for five. Uh, and you notice in the next shot due column, COPA will automatically calculate a next date based on the previous date you've entered. You can change this, but based on what you put in, COPA will just select a date that is 60 days in the future and enter it. So if a child has completed the three shots that they need and they are up to date, you need to pull down that 
menu to the left where it says, or to the right side, sorry, where it says waiver and mark it as in compliance. And then as you see, the record will be marked as complete. At the bottom of this form, it also asks you to pick one. Is your child up to date? Have they received all shots that are possible at this time? Meaning they need more, but they have to wait. Or do they not have immunization? Or uh, do they meet the stage requirements for a waiver? Uh, next slide, please. Now that we've documented their status at the beginning of the year, we need to go in and put their current physical information in under the tab that says medical record. This, once again, if anything on this, on their actual physical disagrees with what you just put in on the, on the health history, you should correct it. Otherwise, we have an ongoing issue in which it looks like children came in with all their screenings, and then in the course of the year, they didn't keep up. So we had fewer children who were up to date at the end of the year and reporting than at the beginning. That's not really true. It's just because the beginning of the year information was inaccurate. So more recently in your query, I have been going into spreadsheets and removing all that information if the child doesn't have a physical. They don't have one entered, obviously, they're not up to date. So, so at this point, you need to put in the physical information. Um, you, you need to have all of it in order to consider the child up to date. That includes things like uh, anemia testing, uh, lead testing, and so on. So you do need to get numbers from the doctor and enter those on the health record. So here I've got screenshots actually from the health history that show this question. Does the child receive um, a continuous source of accessible medical care? That's the question that we're referring to when we say medical home. Is a similar question for a dental. And then when you see the, the three or four options that I was telling you, you have to pick one on an immunization. So those are asked on both forms. They ask the same questions. Uh, at the beginning of the year, they should agree that the status changes later in the year. Obviously, you don't go back and correct the beginning of the year information. But for now, they should, since we're just entering the school year, the information should be the same. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. We also ask for uh, height and weight information to do the growth assessment for children aged uh, three and up, we need to keep track of what their status was, again, at enrollment, because especially for younger children, you may have several different points during the year that you enter this. When you enter the first one during the program year, you should mark the column at the end that says at enrollment. That just means that if we're asking for the child status when they enrolled, this is the one off of the big menu of them that we will be counting. Um, the, the system, when you do this, automatically calculates BMI for children three and up. It does not do that for birth to three, but you can get um, like a height and weight graph and so on out of the system if you require one. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm going to hand this back to Nicole. Thanks, Craig. In regards to health and safety practices, all licensable facilities used for Chicago Early Learning Programming must have a current DCFS and City of Chicago license, and this includes socialization, socialization spaces. License exempt facilities used for Chicago Early Learning Programs must have a current DCFS exemption letter. Programs must conduct health and safety checks on your facilities, indoor and outdoor spaces, to ensure staff are engaged in active supervision. Programs must implement a system for an ongoing preventative maintenance and report any issues or significant issue, issue incidents immediately to your DFSS team lead supervisor. Next slide, please. The Department of Family and Support Services is committed to providing delegate agencies with resources and tools necessary to create safe, positive learning environments. We know that children thrive and demonstrate optimal in learning in environments that are safe and secure. Therefore, it's important that we practice safety and make it a priority at all times. 
the Department of Family and Support Services has adopted the catch principles to for our programs to implement within their pro, within their agencies. CATCH is a creative acronym that has been developed to make it necessary for all levels of staff to remember safety first. CATCH stands for count and call out, assess the environment, think of hiding places, check and check again, and hold them in your sight. Teachers can implement the CATCH principles by adhering to a few simple rules, such as Never leave a coworker alone with children. Use a zone approach to ensure all areas on the playground, on walks, and in classrooms are adequately supervised. Review safety rules, providing reasons to children without giving a lecture or using harsh tones. Consider util utilizing a walking rope or other management devices when taking children for walks. Make walks and outdoor times fun by singing songs. Prep and review safety rules before taking children outdoors each and every time you leave the building. Additionally, program administrators can implement these catch principles by creating child safety systems for indoor and outdoor activities that include written procedures, assigned roles, ensuring adult coverage, and a defined process of accountability. By ensuring regular staff training and regularly monitoring safety systems. And site directors and support staff can implement, implement these principles by monitoring daily to ensure all are following the catch principles and implementing safety systems that are created for your program. Next slide, please. So last year, our Deputy Commissioner of Children's Services, Sarathel Burgess Burnett, sent a letter to all of our delegate agencies regarding how incidents should be reported and what type of information should be reported to DFSS. And so what the department has um, set in place is that all delegate agencies should immediately report any significant incidents to the department. And by immediately, we mean within the same day of the incident. If you are a delegate agency that has partner sites, we strongly encourage you to set a policy in place with your partner sites in which as soon as an incident occurs at the site, that they immediately with, within that same day report the incident to you as the delegate agency. And in turn, as you receive the information, you report it to the department. Types of significant incidents include affect any incidents that affect the health and safety of program, program participants occurrences involving child abuse and neglect, or laws governing sex offenders after the agency has completed its obligation to call DCFS as a mandated reporter. Incidents regarding agency staff, volunteers, or consultants in noncompliance with federal, state, or local laws, cases of communicable disease or other serious health issues, breaches of personally identifiable information, missing or damaged files, incidents that require classrooms or centers to be closed for any reason, disqualification from the child and adult care food program, revocation of a license to operate a center by state or local licensing entity, or circumstances affecting the financial viability of the program, including receipt of an audit, an audit review, investigation, or ins inspection report from an agency auditor that determines that the agency is at risk of ongoing concerns. These are all types of significant incidents that we encourage and we strongly require agencies to report to the department. Next slide, please. Next, this is a copy of the incident reporting form. So whenever an incident occurs at a site or, or a program, this is the form that agencies are required to complete. It complete the information in its entirety and then submit it to your DFSS team lead supervisor. A copy of this incident reporting form will be shared along with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation slide. So you will receive a copy of this if you don't have it. Next slide, please. 
So this is a visual of our reporting hierarchy. As stated earlier, you know, we encourage agencies who have site partners to it have a policy in place in which as soon as an incident occurs at the site, the site reports immediately within the same day of the incident to the delegate agency. In turn, the delegate agency will report to DFSS. And if this is a Head Start involved program or a child that's involved in the Head Start program, DFSS will then report to the Office of Head Start. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss nutrition services. There are requirements um, that are due at the beginning of the year as it relates to nutrition. Nutrition assessments are to be completed and special care plans are to be developed for children as needed. All growth assessments are also to be completed and USDA contracts must be in good standing. Programs are to plan and post menus once the nutritionists and parents have reviewed the menus. And during the first 45 days, programs are to conduct their first classroom food experience. Next slide, please. As it relates to mental health, within the first 45 days, all agencies must create an environment of attitudes and behaviors of well-being throughout the program. Programs must develop contracts with qualified mental health providers and submit completed contracts to DFSS. Mental health consultants must be licensed or certified mental health professionals and have knowledge of and experience in serving young children and their families. Programs must allocate sufficient resources to mental health services in order to provide for services as outlined in the Chicago Early Learning Manual. Mental health services will include individual child and classroom observations, planning with parents about the mental health education program, crisis intervention and referrals, preparing both behavioral plans and individ for individual children and classroom management plans. Continuity of relationships is a model that should be implemented for all of our birth to three programs. Next slide, please. Next, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Angela Hughes, who will explain the hearing and vision screening process. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Elaine Millsap Parker. Uh, I am not sure what's happening um, with our uh, hearing and vision tech supervisor, um, but the next few mm -hmm. slides um, will mm -hmm. give an okay. overview of the expectations of the hearing and vision screenings uh, that our techs provide throughout the course of the program year. It starts off with a cover letter um, that indicates the date of the service that the agency will receive their uh, screenings for the children. It also requests for consent uh, from the parents for hearing and vision be on file. And it also um, adds that there is an assistant uh, to help the technician during the screenings. So you wanna pre-identify someone to support the hearing and vision technician and then the screening should be located um, in, a, in a quiet place uh, for the screenings to be conducted. Next slide, please. I'm here, Elaine. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Okay. Mm. This package will. This package includes a cover letter, which Elaine just explained to you, that includes the screening date. There's also a class list that is provided with the child's name, age, and birthday that we ask that you apply prior to the screening. There's also a practice game. The practice game, we ask that you please play these games within the, with the student starting within the first three days before the screening. This will familiarize your student with the hearing and vision procedures and make them more likely to be able to be screened. 
The hearing and vision screening record form will be provided and also a hearing and vision screening notification that will be posted that says, has your child played the HOTV game? Next slide, please. This is Illinois Department of Public Health who distributes these pamphlets to give you an overview of the preschool vision and hearing screenings for teachers and parents. Next slide, please. This is our Chicago Early Learning Recording Screening Result Form. We, we put the date and the age and the results of the children here. This is an ongoing record that should remain during the duration of the child's enrollment in your program. The outcome of the screenings, which are such as pass, unable, fail, absent, or referred. Any event that a child is, has actually failed the screening, they will be immediately referred. Next slide, please. Any event that the child is referred, this is our cover letter that simply states that the child had had their hearing and vision screening recently conducted at their child's school as required and to please take him or her to an eye or ear specialist as soon as possible. Next slide, please. This is the actual Illinois Department of Public Health Vision Examination Report form is issued to the parents. The parents is also provided with a vision resource list, um, but they are not obligated to, to the list that we provide. They can also take their children to any doctor of their choice. We ask that results are entered into our database, COFA, and the referral outcomes are to return back to the site and to the technician for tracking and follow-up purposes. Next slide, please. As, as the vision referral, this is our hearing referral. It is issued to the parents. Parents is provided with a hearing resource list. Results are entered into our database COPA. Referral outcomes are to return to the site and the technician for tracking and follow-up purposes. Next slide. I will now turn over to Craig Zimpy for referral documentation. Okay, so when you have the vision and hearing screenings completed, they also need to be entered in COPA. Again, they are on the same medical record page as the other health screenings. So you would go to the big, I have the vision history on screen now, but they're the same. You would go, you would go in and um, enter the exam date and the outcome. Uh, this particular case, if a child passes the screening, the, the term that you record is actually no problem suspected. Uh, there is another choice that appears to say complete, but if you mark complete, it means they were referred for treatment and completed it. So again, if they pass, you put it in as no problem suspected, and then enter the. Um, uh, here I've got the next exam date, which is typically just a year in advance. Some of our programs only require screenings every other year, but we at the department, our own internal rule is to do it every year. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand this over to Denise Jordan. Thank you, Craig. Denise Jordan. Supervisors, education, and disabilities. With respect to developmental screenings, within the first 45 days of the child's first day of attendance or the day that they uh, have their first home visit, all programs, as all programs, must conduct or they should obtain a current developmental and social emotional screening. Any child who is returning to the program can be screened beginning July 1st of that, uh, of that year, and it will be counted in the 45-day requirement. Children who may have a current ISSP or an IEP that is certified are not 
necessarily required to take uh, another screening. However, between the family or if a teacher feels as if their child may have some other issues that have not been addressed in the IEP, they can be screened again. All parents and guardians, they must uh, provide a, must be given a, a written, they will give a written consent in order for the screening to be conducted. And parents and guardians must also be provided information regarding number one, the purpose of the screening, two, the screening results, and three, how the screening would be used. We'd like for you to refer to sales 2.0, page 88 to 91 which will give you our research-based development screening tools that are utilized by all of our agencies. It also will tell you what particular uh, staff person is responsible for conducting those tools. Uh, for birth to three, you have agents and stages ASQ and then the ASQSE. Then you have three to five screening the ESIR as well as the ASQSE2. Okay, uh, can I have the next slide, please? All of our delegate agencies have policies and procedures that are, are established regarding the screening process. Currently, though, those policies and procedures must be updated. That updates need to include the health and safety practices, you know, on, on our children who are returning to the classroom. Uh, with respect to any time that they are out of the classroom as we are in right now, the pandemic. And they also have a have been trained, uh, talked about how the screening process will be conducted virtually for those who are e-learners. Of course, the screening process is done the same if they're in person, but virtually there's a different process. So education and disabilities coordinators have received guidance on how to conduct those and that guidance should be used to develop uh, guidance for spe that is specific to the program. We also highly recommend that you review uh, information and guidance and resources provided by the specifically the developer of the ASQ and the ASQ, ASQ3 and the ASQSE. Thank you, Craig. Okay, to document the developmental screenings in COPA, you would go to the developmental tab on the child's data sheet. You will notice that there are three categories that you can see from the developmental page. There is a developmental screening itself, social emotional screening, and sensory. We do not enter the sensory information. We just did that with the hearing and vision screening. In fact, if you have entered the hearing and vision screenings on the medical record. First, when you go to the developmental screening page and look down to the bottom of the screen, you will see the hearing and vision screenings already with the documented, uh, the information was passed along to here. So you would do need to put in a separate screening though for the developmental section and for the social emotional. That's true even if you are putting in a birth to three child and both of those um, tools are the ages and stages questionnaire. And that's because we score them separately. And when we look at um, we look at who is up to date with screening, so we just have one of each documented. COPA is also um, kind of antiquated. Uh, next, next screen, please. COPA has a was a system that we adopted when most of our programming was Head Start and Early Head Start, and now we have several other sources of funding. However, COPA still wants you to document screenings by what's called PIR program model. And the problem with that obviously is that with blended funding, you can have uh, children who are funded by more than one program. So for simplicity and sanity's sake, we ask everyone when they enter this information to enter all three to five-year-olds as under the Head Start PIR program model and all birth to three-year-olds under Early Head Start. 
Uh, it's because we have many classrooms where some of the children are in one program, some of the children are in another, but it is much more useful if you go in to do the reporting and can see your entire class on the same report rather than having to look at the differently funded children differently. Next slide, please. So you can track the development screening status using the 456 report. Uh, there is a default version of this report, but if you open up the link on the report that says Memorize Reports, you'll see that there are several different reports for each year that we have built out in the system so that you can look for particular things without having to do all the customization yourself. Um, for this year right now, I have four reports. There are two that are all one of them is all birth to three children enrolled in this program here, and one is all three to five children. And then I have one that's just for early Head Start and just for Head Start, so that Head Start and early Head Start funded agencies can see what their status is going to be on the PIR. Um, you will also notice, though, that there are several different ways to screen these. So because from our point of view, we're trying to figure out what needs to be done yet to come into compliance. I've filtered these program reports to come out with children with no matching data. That means if you first run these reports, you will see the children who have not been screened. However, if you want to instead flip that around and look at which children have received their screenings and what the outcome was, you can go into uh, filtering open up the additional filtering tab and change where it says children with no matching data to children with matching data and then you will be able to see a list of all the children who have had their developmental screenings but for now since most of them aren't in it's more useful the way it is you'll see the names of children with nothing next to them and you will know that these children still need to be screened by the 45th day which unless i miss my guess for children who started the first day is october 22nd Next slide, please. I'm going to hand this over to Elaine, I think. Yes. Hello, everyone. This is Elaine Millsap Parker, Assistant Director in Children's Services Division in the Program Operations Unit. And I'm going to talk to you today about um, program design and management uh, 45th day requirements, um, starting with program governance. Um, we want to make sure that you are aware that for this new program year, um, agencies are expected to convene and conduct parent committee and policy committee um, meetings. Um, we know that in this world uh, today with the pandemic, um, that these efforts should be done uh, virtually um, or by telephone conferencing. And so some of the things that we want you to work on within this first quarter of the program year is make sure that you are um, implementing activities for establishing your program's um, newly, newly elected or re-elected policy committee. Make sure that you support your parents in convening their monthly parent and policy committee meetings and maintain um, your record keeping systems for securing um, meeting materials and data. Uh, within this first quarter of the program year, we want to make sure that you conduct your parent orientation at each site, um, as well as at your partner sites, um, which should include educating your parents on the policy committee service and parent committee involvement expectations. You should also be conducting your parent committee elections for site officers and policy committee members for the program year. Uh, your policy committees should be established and seated um, within the first quarter of this program year and the letter of certification that identifies who your elected delegate and alternate are, as well as your policy committee members. This document is due to DFSS on November 30th, um, and it should be sh submitted to Tasha Smith at Tasha, T-O-S-H dot Smith at cityofchicago.org. The application um, is available on the Children's Services website um, at childrenservicesChicago.com. And so you can find the form there as well. Next slide, please. 
The program management 45th day to first quarter milestones for this program year. One of the things that we want you to do is to conduct your quality assurance assessment. And that's just your internal monitoring system. This is something we talked about during your respective roundtables to sure up your monitoring. We want you to make sure that all staff have current physicals and that the dates are recorded in the staff's COPA HR file. We want you to make sure that all new and existing staff have received, reviewed, and signed the standards of conduct acknowledgement forms. Um, and make sure that you provide your staff with a copy of that signed form so that they can be mindful of the culture of safety and no harm being done to children throughout the program year. We want to make sure that all staff have criminal records clearance dates that's recorded in the COPA HR file and that the respective uh, documentation is uploaded to the COPA eDocs. Just a reminder, no identifying information or health history um, or health information should be uploaded to COPA eDocs. You want to protect the confidentiality of the staff. All staff as applicable should have a current first aid CPR certifications and that that information is updated and entered into COPA as well as them completing the mandated reporter training. All new staff uh, should receive an orientation within 90 days of hire, which includes the review of the standards of conduct and the sign acknowledgement form. Within the first 30 days of this program year, you should conduct the pedestrian safety training for parents and children um, and make sure that you file the respective certifications um, verifying that this training was done within the first 30 days of the program year. And these forms can be found um, on the Children's Services website as well. Make sure that you conduct bus monitoring training for staff that may accompany children on field trips involving bus transportation as well. And there are bus safety checklists that need to be completed and submitted to the department and you can find those documents as well on the Children's Services website. Um, as it relates to COPA, uh, COPA HR, um, please note that um, we want you to make sure that you know who your admin users are. Uh, last month, the department sent out an admin users guide for COPA HR. So make sure that you review that document and you know who your admin users are so that the information can be entered into COPA within a timely manner. Later on in this program year, um, this first quarter of the program year, we will be talking more about um, data entry for the COPA HR file um, as we move forward. Thank you. Next slide, please. I will now turn it back over to Nicole Kraft, uh, Supervisor in Children's Services Division. Thank you, Elaine. So the Office of Head Start, in addition to providing guidance as it relates to the health services area, they also provided guidance as it relates to family and community engagement as to how program services shall be conducted for this program year. This year, although we are experiencing an unprecedented season, an unprecedented time, the Office of Head Start does require that education services staff and parents continue to communicate regularly about a child's learning, development, routines, and progress, and parent-teacher conferences should continue. Programs must continue to ensure staff are able to communicate effectively with children who are dual language learners, either directly or through interpretation and translation, and to the extent possible, with families with limited English proficiency. Family engagement events are not a requirement, although many programs offer events for families to interact with each other. Um, this year, due to the uncertainty that surrounds COVID-19, DFSS is strongly discouraging any, any in-person gatherings as it relates to family and community engagement. We want to make sure that everyone is safe and healthy, and so we strongly discourage programs from hosting any type of engagement with families in person. Next slide, please. 
So now we'll talk about what is expected during the first 45 days as it relates to family engagement and community partnerships. Within the first 45 days of enrollment, programs should hire their family support specialist or family support worker. All programs must offer parents opportunities to engage in family goal setting and take into consideration the family's willingness to engage in the process. Programs must offer families the opportunity to engage in the process, and this should be done within the first 60 days of enrollment. Appropriate referrals and contacts with families should be ongoing, and this should happen within every 30, every 30 days. They should maintain contact with families. Programs are to implement parent orientation and share the parent handbook and begin to create community partnership agreements with local organizations. Parents as teachers and baby talk are the approved research-based curricula. If there are any other curriculum models, that um, your program wishes to use, they must be approved by the Department of Family and Support Services. Next slide, please. Now I'll hand it back over to Craig, who will share information of how to enter this data into COPA. Okay, there have been a few changes in recent years about how we enter family and community partnership information into COPA. So even if you're an old hand at this, there may be some things that have changed that you should be aware of. Uh, the first of all, that to be able to keep track of where we are with having developed and implemented family goals, there are kind of a three steps of special process that you need to go through to make sure that they'll show up on all the relevant reports. So to begin documenting family goals, the first thing you do is not document family goals, but go to the family data sheet and enter desired services. What this means is when you've done the family assessment with families, which you should have started to do by now, you will identify areas that the family has identified as a concern that they want to work on. And you would mark any of these that are relevant on the family data sheet, and then goals should be developed within one of the categories that was identified. If you another goal, comes up later in the program here, you just come back here and, and add that issue on so that there's somewhere to put it. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So once you have added these categories, you can then go into the Family Goals tab. You select the Edit Pencil to add a new goal. And here on the Goals page, you could then go down and look at this list. The list of possible categories here is the same list that you had for identified areas. Uh, and I think there's a link where you can see that. So you would go ahead and put in the area of the need before writing up the brief description, the goal date, and, and so on. Now, as you're developing these, you notice that this is a list that you can add a goal again and again. So the best practice is not to have a huge overarching goal, but to have the specific steps in this goal so you can mark them as complete. For example, if a family's goal is to get an AA degree in early childhood, that is too big and takes too long to be one goal. So I would put in apply for school as a goal and then attend a class and then graduate as different ones so that, so that while we go through the process, we can document progress. Uh, next goal, please. Our next page, please. Excuse me. So once you have goals in, you can add a specific referral and service. Uh, so this would be related to the goal and documenting how the family is going about getting the needs met. There is a referral link that's on the family page, but we ask you really not to add them there because those are off kind of in the data, off in space somewhere in the data. Instead, if you go stay on the family goals page and hit new referral on the right within the goal that's already been identified, now the, goal, the referral or service will be associated with this particular goal. The reason we want to do that is then you can easily track all of the goals that are in process or completed and what the status is from the 1009 family goals report and as you can see there are goals 
and referrals within the on that report. If, but if you add the goal separately instead of doing it through the goal for you add the referral separately rather than going through the family goals link, it won't show up on this report. So we've had a number of people uh, writing and calling us recently uh, asking about that issue. And the solution is just, again, to stay within the goal for the entire process of documenting how you go about in achieving it. Next goal. Next page, please. I'm going to hand this back to B. Nichols. Thank you, Greg. Now we just want to provide you with some resources that will assist you within these first 45 days and beyond. The Vision for Schools program, or VSP, is a really wonderful program. They can provide families with a certificate for free eyeglasses. If you have any questions about this, or will you um, want to get a certificate for your families, I encourage you to reach out to Angela Hughes or any of the technicians, the ones that are assigned to your site. The Caring for Our Children National Health and Safety Performance Standards is another really valuable resource. This resource provides safety measures for indoors and outdoors and even on the bus. eClick, or the Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center, is primarily a Head Start resource. There are many good vignettes and case studies and information that can be found on this website, along with best practices that really any early childhood program could use. Also, the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services has licensing standards that are a benefit for all of our agencies to know and be familiar with, as well as the FSS's policies and procedures. And everything that you've heard here today can be found in the sales manual. Next slide. It's very important that you all have an effective system to monitor every area of services in uh, your programs. Today, we realize that we focused on those priorities that must happen within the first 45 days. But you need to have tools in place and people in place that are monitoring with regularity, ongoing monitoring. CSD will be offering additional information in each of these respective areas. So look for all upcoming training dates and topics via the CSD electronic updates, as well as monitoring teams tab. They will be forwarding this information to you. Next slide. So thank you for joining us today on the webinar and we will be speaking with you soon. Thank you.